Hello, folks. Welcome to another edition of Inside the Marble Palace. Post Media's look at the goings on in Saskatchewan legislature with a bit of a twist this week because we have an expert with us, Dr. Alec Wong, Alex Wong of uh, uh, an infectious disease specialist in uh, Regina, who's done some incredibly great work uh, on uh, informing the public on on Omicron. Thank you so much for joining joining us, Dr. Wong. I'll be calling you uh, Alex all, along the way, so par uh, pardon me for that. But thank you so much for joining us. I we really appreciate it. It's a pleasure, Murray. And uh, you know, I watch this. Uh, I watch this quite often. So it's uh, it's a thrill to be invited, and I'm glad to be here. And of course, always with, is with us uh, Jeremy Sines, uh, our legislative bureau reporter in uh, Regina. Thanks for joining us, uh, Jeremy. Something a little different. We're just going to turn the the podcast over to questions to uh, 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 Alex because well, I think what's happening right now is rather interesting in light of the Premier Scott Moe's statement last night uh, suggesting that uh, we're moving forward in terms of removing uh, restrictions. He is basing this largely on the notion that Omicron is a, is a disease whose spread that can't be stopped with back vaccinations. I think last night, uh, Alex, he offered maybe a slightly milder version in saying that there's as many cases of people vaccinated with Omicron as there were unvaccinated, which is slightly different than, I guess, him saying that uh, uh, vaccinations aren't working. But I know that you've uh, talked about this intent, uh, intensely on uh, social media and other places. If you would be so kind, can you go again, explain to us why vaccinations uh, related to uh, this particular variant of uh, COVID-19, the Omicron variant, variant, are actually stopping uh, uh, the spread in your medical opinion? Sure, Murray. So I think last night, the premier in his, uh, he posted a couple of videos. I watched them on Twitter and, uh, you know, he, he made comments again about vaccines. And I think his comment said something to the effect of um, <clears throat> that the numbers of individuals uh, unvaccinated and vaccinated who were getting Omicron was uh, was roughly the same or something to that effect. Right. Um, That's right. Which which is which is technically true. Um, that is a true statement. Uh, the the challenge again is is that uh, there's a lot to unpack with regards to the data around cases, and around how vaccines work. And so, again, just some facts, just to start out with, you know, and these facts are are are, are I think crystal clear based on, you know, very solid scientific data evidence from every single jurisdiction around the world. So I don't think there's any question about any of this stuff. I'll just kind of put it out there. So first is that if you're if you have three doses uh if you're triple vaxxed uh you know you have significant protection against omicron infection probably somewhere in the range depending on what study you look at of you know between 55 and 70 percent somewhere in that range probably about two-thirds protection so you know it's not perfect uh you know but that's still really good right and that that's why that's why getting that third dose is so critically important because uh, when you got those three doses on board, that can really help prevent, you know, uh, you from getting Omicron with an exposure. I've had, you know, a couple of exposures at this point where I've been a close contact, triple vaxxed, uh, you know, uh, and my wife as well. And we've been fortunate enough, again, between masking and being triple vaxxed, not to get COVID as of yet. So the other thing, obviously, which the Premier has certainly stated is, is that having vaccines two doses, but ideally three doses, significantly reduces the likelihood of severe illness and ending up in the hospital in the ICU. And if you have three doses on board, you know, that reduction is is incredibly high, probably well over 95%. So again, this is why getting those three doses, everybody eligible getting those three doses is absolutely critical because, you know, I mean, cases are gonna happen. We, we realize this, we know that Omicron is incredibly contagious. There's an, uh, you know, there's uh, an immune invasiveness component to Omicron as well. So, you know, that's just kind of where we're at right now. But again, keeping people out of hospital, keeping people out of ICU, minimizing the strain on our healthcare system, that's what's critically important. And, you know, based on, you know, kind of what I looked at from a couple of days ago, I think right now we have something like 35, 36% 
of the entire Saskatchewan population who've been triple vaxxed. Um, and that's just not, it's not optimal. I mean, we really wish that that number could be higher, like 50, 60 percent, but we're just not quite there. So uh, before I turn it over to, to Jeremy, I just have one bit, bit of a follow up in relation to what you're say, saying. Your <laughs> frustration, I'm thinking right now, is the notion that what has been said by the premier last night and previously, uh, even if that wasn't his intent, and I'm not sure what his mm-hmm. intent was, to be quite frank, but mm-hmm. even if that wasn't his intent, your worry is that anything that dissuades people from getting a first dose, a second dose, and more, and now critically the third dose is hugely problematic for what's going on in the health system right now and the hospitalization. I, I imagine Jeremy can get into that with you in a moment, but, uh, but I'm just kind of curious if I'm yep. getting that right. Yeah, 100%. So, I mean, you know, the most important thing that any jurisdiction around the world can do in order to essentially return to some semblance of normalcy where wave upon wave upon wave of COVID with whatever new variant there will be, you know, doesn't continue to overwhelm healthcare systems is by optimizing vaccination rates across their entire population. And that that's the bottom line. So when you look at certain jurisdictions, for example, in Western Europe, like the UK, like Denmark, again, who were sort of leading the way in terms of, uh, you know, removing, uh, you know, sort of measures and restrictions and and trying to open things up. The fundamental difference between those jurisdictions and, for example, all of North America, you know, there's differences between where you look in North America, but uh, the, the primary difference is, is that their vaccine uptake is just tremendously higher. You look at Denmark, they're at something like 61% eligible having received their third dose. I mean, whereas we're at like 36%, that's a huge 25% difference. That's literally the difference between keeping our healthcare systems, you know, sort of from being overwhelmed and getting overwhelmed. So anything that the premier says, uh, you know, that that undermines that public confidence in vaccines and undermines the message that we've been trying to put out that, you know, Dr. Shaheb has continued been trying to put out is really damaging. And it's, it, it's just irreversibly damaging in terms of, you know, again, people not understanding how important it is to get vaccinated and to get that third dose. Because if you've only got two and you're out five, six months, then practically speaking, your protection against getting Omicron is almost zero. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Jeremy because uh, please go ahead, Jeremy. I just interrupted you and you're about to ask a question. So. No, it's OK. Yeah, no, I was going to ask, you know, what do you what do you think we're going to see as a result of of, um, I guess these remarks the premier is making this idea that it's um, not so serious in a way. Uh, do you expect fewer people getting vaccinated and what do you think the result would be of that in a way? Yeah, unfortunately, what's going to happen is is that our vaccine drive is just going to continue to slow. And I, I, it's kind of naturally slowed again over time, right? Uh, that's that's sort of a given, um, you know. Uh, and so what we really needed was we we need strong clear messaging from everyone, from our public health leaders, from our elected officials, from everyone that people listen to about how critically important getting vaccinated is, especially getting that third dose. Um, And anything that sort of pushes back against that, even if there's not necessarily an intent to push back against that, is just incredibly unhelpful and damaging. I mean, we've gone literally from stick it to COVID back in, you know, early 2021. Remember when everybody was proudly kind of showing their stickers and it was like the best thing ever to a situation now where it's just as critically important for everyone to get those third doses on board. And yet we are not messaging that, right? I mean, I think again, mandates and all the rest of it, we knew it was gonna go. We knew we could see this, we could see this coming. It's not really a surprise that it's gonna come and it's gonna probably come quite quickly. But I don't see why we need to also at the same time confuse and muddle the messaging around vaccines. I think that just is a damaging thing, which uh, it's gonna be difficult again for the province to recover from when we already have like either the lowest or next to next to last lowest vaccine uptake in the country. And all this means is, is that our Omicron wave is just going to drag out. And unfortunately, you know, there probably will be another wave just because we have billions of people in the world who aren't vaccinated. And that's just the reality of where we're at right now. And when that next wave comes and we have relatively, you know, sort of low vaccine uptake relative to the rest of the world and all other jurisdictions, we're probably going to have the exact same situation all again. It sounds kind of depressing. It actually is kind of depressing, but that's just the reality of it. I mean, pretending it's not there doesn't change the fact that that's reality, unfortunately. 
Right. Um, is it okay if I ask another one? Ready? No, go Sorry. ahead. Follow up. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, you mentioned messaging, and it's a lot of uh, mixed messaging, right? We have the premier saying uh, one thing. We're hearing things from you as a doctor and other doctors. Um, the public's getting two messages all the time. Uh, what do you think they should do with these messages in a way? You know, that's a tough question because, uh, you know, there's a lot of public trust. There should be public trust in elected officials. I mean, that's that's why we that's why we elect elected officials, right? Uh, elected officials are supposed to act, you know, in a way that that conveys trust, integrity, humility, you know, all of these things that we, we, we want to actually see and see modeled, I think, from our elected officials. And um, so the last couple of weeks, honestly, have been a little bit challenging. Uh, and, you know, it's one thing I think in my mind, uh, you know, I'm not so naive any longer as to not understand the fact that there's many, many factors in play here when we're trying to make decisions. And by no means am I sitting here and thinking that, you know, this 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 whole thing with measures and, you know, uh, and so forth is going to carry on. I think everyone in the developed world, pretty much when their Omicron surge is done, whatever that looks like, they're pretty much going to be removing restrictions and measures. You know, the thing that we were just asking for, honestly, is if we could have just waited a little bit longer because we're we're just getting crushed in the hospitals right now. We're setting daily records every single day for the number of COVID positive individuals in hospital. And, you know, it's taken a huge toll again on the system, just like our Delta wave, just like our Alpha wave here in Regina. It was just so that's kind of what we were hoping for. But then to throw on this additional sort of piece where, you know, there's just half truths and, you know, misinformation, frank misinformation at times with regards to vaccines. You know, my colleagues, I think I've been proud to see, you know, a lot of my colleagues like Dr. Mahajarin, Dr. Newdorf, uh, Dr. Rasmussen at Vido, uh, you know, many others just tried to do the best they can to continue to advocate, to continue to speak the scientific truth and to continue to try to, again, put forward a unified message that this is the science and this is the evidence. And, you know, we just want everybody to know that that's what the truth is. Um, and confusing that messaging ultimately, I think, damages everyone in the province with regards to, you know, uh, you know, just putting us uh, at risk and making the entire province vulnerable down the line to another significant surge. And again, the same, you know, sad story with regards to our healthcare system. If I may jump in here, I, I, I think this is where people are having a hard time understanding and sometimes the information that we have to give them has to be in smaller bites. And mm -hmm. I guess one of the things that they're having a hard time getting ahead of their head around is that they, they know a lot more people are getting Omicron. They're mm -hmm. encountering people getting o Omicron that maybe they didn't in previous waves. Mm -hmm. They see that they're getting less sick, but they don't necessarily and properly interpret that to mean that there's a problem in hospitals. So I, my mm -hmm. question is kind of twofold, Dr. Wong. First of all, if there are less people getting uh, seriously sick from the Omicron variant, mm -hmm. why is there such a crush in hospitals? And secondly, can you actually elaborate on what that crush looks like right now? Because I don't think a lot of people understand how bad it is. That, that, from what I'm understanding from talking to other doctors mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that I talk to, they're worried right now. It's not only as bad as the Delta variant right now, but it's going to be far worse. So mm -hmm. those two questions, why aren't people winding up in hospital with Omicron if Omicron isn't as bad? And secondly, uh, what's it like in hospitals right now? Yeah, so lots to unpack there, Marie. Good questions. So I think the first question, again, is a very common one, and it's difficult because a lot of people, you know, it's hard to sometimes step back and look at the big picture because this wave has been very different than many, many other waves. I think almost every, basically everybody, like everywhere, like in the developed world, and that includes here in Saskatchewan, we all know people, a lot of people actually, who have gotten COVID or almost assuredly have gotten COVID. And the vast majority of those people probably have recovered. They probably felt unwell for a few days and so forth and got over it, right? And some of those people are triple vaxxed. Some of those people have two doses. Some of those people might not be vaccinated. And so people's kind of personal sort of experience then sort of kicks in, right? It's that anecdotal thing. It's like, okay, well, I know so-and-so got it or I know that family got it or I know my friend got it. She felt, you know, kind of crappy for a few days, got better. What's the big deal here? 
So, you know, that's completely understandable, right? So there's a bit of a mental kind of disconnect that occurs because, again, I mean, we're talking about like a million people here. So uh, the problem is, is uh, again, Omicron does uh, appear, it is, it's not appear, it, it is less inherently severe than previous variants, whether that be alpha or delta. So what that means is, again, I mean, the likelihood of you getting seriously ill with alpha and delta, it, you know, all things being equal, like vaccine status being equal, all the rest of it being equal, all your medical conditions being equal, you know, uh, your, your chances of getting seriously ill, ending up in hospital and ICU with alpha and delta, definitely higher than with Omicron. And there's various reasons for that. We won't go into all the details. The problem is, is that Omicron is so freaking contagious. Uh, and again, the other challenge is, is that two doses of vaccine, one dose of vaccine, not being vaccinated, again, does not protect you from getting infected. Um, so everybody is getting it. You know, everybody then is spreading it and you get a huge number of people, way, way more people getting Omicron compared to something like Alpha or Delta, right? When we were still, uh, there were still measures, people were still taking uh, a lot of precautions and so forth. And people weren't necessarily, you know, vaccinated at that time either. So the problem is, is even if you have a less severe problem, if you have like, you know, a, yeah, a factor of, you know, 10 or 100 times more individuals actually getting sick, then what that means is, is that there are going to be a relatively small proportion of those people who, who end up in the hospital, end up in the ICU. But you're talking about a really, really big number and a small proportion of a really big number is still more it's than a enough to crush, yeah. our, to crush our hospitals and ICUs, right? So that's the inherent sort of, again, sort of piece that, again, I get it, people, it, it's hard, right? Because you just kind of look around you, you see what's happening around you, you see your friends and family and, you know, people you know getting it, they're recovering, no big deal, it's just a cold. But the problem is, is that there's somebody out there, you know, who's medically frail, who's got a lot of comorbidities, they get Omicron, they might be triple vaxxed, but because they've got a lot of their pre-existing problems or medical comorbidities, they end up in hospital because they just aren't, you know, as healthy as you are, for example, or your friends or your family or whatever else. So that's, to, I think, trying to answer your first question, Marie. Um, so the second question around sort of uh, hospitals and what things are looking like in the hospitals right now. So. It is fundamentally different. Uh, Omicron uh, has been fundamentally different thus far in the hospitals, uh, not just here in Saskatchewan, but across like all of the developed world. We're seeing less individuals ultimately end up in ICU. And that's, again, there's various reasons for that uh, that are inherent to the virus itself. The main one being that it seems as, as though there's less aggressive sort of replication and damage that it's, that's actually occurring in the lungs with Omicron compared to Delta, compared to Alpha. So you don't end up with these, you know, really, really, really super sick people who are otherwise healthy at times who just get, you know, completely ravaged, like their lungs are ravaged. And, you know, those are the poor folks that end up on a, you know, ventilator for weeks, you know, are severely ill, you know, and, and take months to recover. So we're not seeing, I mean, there is still some cases happening where people are actually getting that sick and having you know, what we call ARDS and sort of lung failure, but that is nowhere near as common with Omicron, especially if you're vaccinated compared to Alpha and Delta. So Before I turn it over to J Jeremy, I I'm curious about that because people talk about her herd mentality, uh, herd immunity and herd mentality, her herd immunity, there's a bit of herd mentality going on, herd immunity right uh, right now. But what, what I think gets missed in that conversation is herd immunity means that some in the herd suffer. And uh, yeah. and beyond that, it doesn't seem that we're going to achieve uh, herd immunity, despite what the premier is saying right now. So before I, I, I leave the next question to Jeremy, I'm just kind of uh, uh, curious as to whether do, do we are we ever going to get herd immunity as, as seems to now be implied by uh, what the premier is doing or yeah, it's tough to know. And I mean, nobody knows the answer to this. Um, you know, everybody wants desperately and hopes desperately to believe that, you know, you're going to get Omicron, you're going to have an incredible, you know, immune response that's going to be protective, you know, forever against future variants and going to be protective forever, you know, down the road. That probably is not going to be the case. There's some very early data now. It's all very early. So again, I, I think the consensus is still very much out there. We don't know. But it's a huge gamble to bet that, uh, you know, if you get Omicron 
And if you're not vaccinated, um, you know, that that is then going to lead to, you know, durable lifelong immunity. I think the likelihood of that and again, I'm just a I'm just a simple clinician. I, you probably need to ask, you know, super smart virology folks and immunology folks like Angie Rasmussen here in Saskatchewan or Allison Kelvin here in Saskatchewan. But I think the consensus would probably be that that's not going to happen. And there's some data that actually shows some early data that actually shows that if you're fully vaccinated or actually triple vaccinated and you get Omicron, you actually develop a much more aggressive uh, immune response compared to if you're not, which is kind of interesting. There, there's a lot of different things to sort of unpack from that, but just getting triple vaccinated just has so many benefits that we're just learning ab about and understanding now around reducing your risk of long-term COVID complications, about actually uh, leading to more durable immunity over time that could protect you from a variety of other variants. Uh, so, and obviously keeping you from getting sick in the first place. So there's just so many benefits to getting triple vaxxed at this point that, I mean, again, I understand the whole thing about measures and so forth, but boy, should we really be pushing, you know, boosters and third doses on everyone as much as possible. And, you know, in an ideal world, we would have had, you know, some sort of a mandate or proof of vaccine program, which would have pushed that along. And that would have really, you know, surged our, our, our third dose uptake that probably won't happen now. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask about the lifting of these restrictions and proof of vaccination. The premier saying um, could happen within February, before the end of February, at least. Yeah. Um, for for doctors and yourself, do you have an, an idea of what would be an ideal time to do that um, in terms of lifting those restrictions? Uh, well, I guess the simple answer is, is that we'd probably like those, you know, sort of measures, at least the proof of vaccine program at a minimum, I think, to probably continue for some time because there is no other system level intervention that does more to actually really push our vaccine drive than that proof of vaccine program. That's that's really the bottom line. The evidence is there. It's very, very clear. And there's a lot of other jurisdictions around the world, like in Europe, for example, that are pushing uh, you know, and 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 are, and are going to change the definition of fully vaccinated right to three doses. So again, I mean, if you decide to you know have a trip to I don't know Italy or France, for example, like in a couple months, then yeah, you're not going to be able to get in anywhere or do anything or go anywhere unless you have three doses. So you know that just makes public health sense, and that's I think what our public health leaders have been calling for. Uh, you know, it just has fallen on deaf ears. And again, I get it. I'm not naive. But truthfully, I think the timing probably realistically would have been better to make these announcements and to say, you know, look, okay, it's all going to come to an end once we clearly, you know, had peaked, you know, with respect to our hospitalizations, which we know lag, you know, sort of, you know, sort of the actual case curve and case peak by probably like two, three weeks. And, you know, again, our cases, it's really hard to interpret our case data now because, nobody's really going to reliably go get PCR testing done, quite frankly. So it's hard to know with that. So we're really looking at hospitalizations and ICU admissions as being the key metric. And again, we're still seeing that going up, up, up. Sadly, it's probably going to be another week or two before we see that peak. I mean, I'm praying it's going to be sooner, but uh, it's probably going to be another week or two. And at that point, it'd be like, OK, fine. Like, we, you know, we see it coming. It's coming down. Tell us when it's going to be done. OK, fine. Now, you know, uh, knowing that it's going to happen maybe in a week or two or, you know, in the worst case scenario for us on the medical side. Again, all that means is, is that if you had a bunch of people sitting on the fence going like, oh, do I get this done? You know, do I not get this done? Clearly, that's just going to you know push people, you know, towards saying, you know what, it's not that important. Right. Uh, and that's that's a real challenge and problem for our province. Right, and I wanted to follow up too on uh, the Premier's uh, tweets uh, last night. He mm -hmm. kind of mentioned, um, you know, go live your life, go travel, go visit. I mean, at the same time, uh, do a rapid test and stay home if you're sick. But I'm just wondering if that's also not the correct message right now in your view, uh, just telling people to go travel, go live your life, that sort of thing. You know, we we understand and I think again, all of us on the medical side and on the public health side. I'm not again. I'm I'm a phys I'm a medical physician. I'm not a public health physician, but we all get the fact that everybody is just bloody sick and tired of this. Like we get it. We completely get it. I am too. Like you know what? I want to just go back. I want to go to the movies. I want to you know I want to go out and just you know have a nice meal. 
with my wife and not worry about COVID, not think about stuff like ventilation in the restaurant and not look around me and wonder like whether or not, you know, someone's symptomatic or whether someone's fully vaccinated or not. It's just, we're all tired of it. So I, I actually, I, I have no issues with the premier talking about how we need to kind of move to that point because I mean, society's just sick and tired of it, right? We, we get that. So the question is, is how do we find some balance, I think, between, you know, keeping things safe and allowing people to do things that, you know, everybody wants to do, right? We, we want our kids to be out and active. We want our, we want to be able to kind of enjoy all these social activities, just missing, just seeing people. And we just have to figure out ways to do that, that, that are safe and responsible, which means, again, getting triple vaccinated, masking appropriately in appropriate settings, probably avoiding like, you know, really crowded indoor gatherings and, you know, thinking about stuff like ventilation and stuff. Um, you know, and again, being being responsible in terms of, okay, if you're symptomatic, stay home, do a rapid test. All of that messaging, I think, and I, when I listened to the videos last night from the premier, I, I thought that messaging was just fine. The challenge, again, is is finding that balance, right? And the key piece, in my opinion, is is that vaccine piece and getting triple vaccinated. If you are triple vaccinated and you wear a good, like high quality mask, like a N95 or something similar, like a KN95 or a KF94, which you can get, you know, you gotta find the one that's gonna fit best for you. But if you can do those two things as, a, as an individual citizen, or if you can get your kids to do that, you know, then honestly, you're going to be about as safe as 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 pre-COVID, essentially. Like you're at a point where your risk of getting infected is so low, um, and your risk of obviously getting really sick and having a bad outcome is so low. You can pretty much live your life. It just means that you got to be a little bit careful and you got to get fully vaccinated. So, it's balancing all of those messages, I think, which is critically important. And and how hard is it really for people to get fully vaccinated and to wear a mask in appropriate settings, right? Like, that's not. That's not infringing on freedoms, but again, it's become so symbolic that it is right, and that that's just not been helpful. And it's not just here in Saskatchewan; that's it's it's around all of North America. So that, that to me is kind of the way forward. And then the other big thing I just got to say it for the record is is that we can't forget, you know, about our neighbors, you know, across the world, you know, uh, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, where, uh, you know, we got three oh, still over like three billion people in the world who have yet to be vaccinated. We need to advocate, you know, for global vaccine equity and and to try to get, you know, our vaccine push, you know, in that population as quickly as possible. Because again, it's it's about getting the whole world protected, the whole world vaccinated. That's what's going to keep us from having surge after surge after surge after surge. So, you know, but here at home, it's about finding that balance and about messaging that in a way, you know, that's responsible. And I, I don't see why we couldn't message all of that, but at the same time talk about, again, like removing certain types of measures and programs and restrictions and so forth, right? Uh, that's just my perspective. And it's a fantastic one, uh, Dr. Wong. We so thank you for your time today. I wish we had more time because uh, this is why uh, when people struggle with why we write what we do and why we're saying what we do, well, because we talk to people like you who know what the hell they're talking about because obviously we don't any more than than most people but our job is to find people that do and i hope people take your message about the need for vaccination seriously and i hope that uh, regardless of what now happens and and when we will open up the province that there's a special emphasis on that so thank you to you thank you to jeremy again obviously for for joining us in the good questions but thank you so much dr wong i i i'm sure the public really appreciates your view and your perspective and your knowledge so uh, yeah it's a pleasure uh murray and uh, jeremy and it was fun actually uh maybe we can do it again sometime you know we might have to sadly <laughs> I, th I thank you both uh so but but that's about it for this week see you next week on inside the marble palace